On Larry King now, it's showrunner week. We're joined by Sons of Anarchy creator Kurt Sutter. My secret to my success is that I, I hire people who are a lot more talented than me. And uh, um, <laughs> I, you know, I think to really have a vision and to follow through, you can't lock yourself in the ivory tower. And you really have to be involved in, in all aspects. Plus, the man who brought you the hit show Lost, Carlton Cuse. It was really, I think, an attitude, particularly in 2004 when that show started in network television, that you had to kind of go for the lowest common denominator. And Lost didn't do that. Lost actually respected the intelligence of an audience. And I think that the audience in turn responded because the show, the show challenged them in ways. You have to find that alchemy of a writer's room that can actually work together to produce really good scripts and then you need really good actors to deliver your material. Plus, one has to ask, why all the tattoos? They all have meaning and, and stuff, but at, at the end of the day, it's all just a desperate cry for attention, really, Larry. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now, Kurt Sutter, one of the most successful people in television, writer and executive producer for The Shield, wrapping up the seventh and final season of Sons of Anarchy, airing this September on FX, while developing the bastard executioner. That's not all. He's the screenwriter for the upcoming film Southpaw, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, one of my favorite people. Did you think you're responsible for this cable revolution that, that The Shield sort of... Uh, I, I, I think that... Um... The Shield came along at a time when, the, you know, that when cable dramas were, were really on the rise. And uh, when we premiered on that station, they, we were their first original program. On FX. On FX. And, uh, um, and, uh, and no one really knew could, or could see where it was going. We knew we had something different uh, uh, and something special. And, Obviously. Uh, and John, John Landgraf, the president of FX, right. credits you with... The network, two of the, the most successful show, The Shield and Sons of Anarchy, right? Yeah, I uh, and I was lucky enough. I was uh, I started out as a staff writer on The Shield and 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 finished as an executive producer. And and Sean Ryan, who created that show, was was a great mentor for me. And uh, uh, um, and really, you know, and I loved the show. I stayed all seven seasons. And uh, uh, clearly, I don't like change because I, I'm doing Sons, and then my my next show is at FX too. So uh, you're attached to FX. I am, I am. Do you think there'd be a Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, Mad Men without the shield? Oh, that's a good question. I think that uh, uh, it definitely helped uh, open the doors uh, for shows that had that kind of t content and tone. You know, the same way I think, you know, um, The Sopranos, uh, you know, I don't know if there would have been uh, a Sons of Anarchy without a Sopranos in terms of people being able to embrace uh, uh, an outlaw, uh, you know, hero like that. As I Love Lucy led to sitcoms. Exactly, yeah. exactly. How did the idea of Sons of Anarchy come about a motorcycle? You came here on a motorcycle, right? I, I did, I did, I rode in today. That's I, about a motorcycle club, an outlaw motorcycle. Right, right. I, How did um, that come about? You know, I, I was finishing up on The Shield, and, and as, as we do, we, we look for other projects, and uh, I've always had a fascination with the subculture. I love bikes. I, I came across country my first time here on a motorcycle, and, uh, and I was lucky enough, I hooked up with uh, 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 John Linson and Art Linson, uh, who are uh, f um, um, feature producers, and uh, they um, were trying to do a feature in the motorcycle, uh, outlaw motorcycle world. And we started talking and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, and they sort of gave me carte blanche to- Did you to, get any impetus from Brando's The Wild Ones or is that too old for you? No, I think all that- That was a wild movie. I think all that stuff, you know, um, feeds uh, the subculture. I think it, it you know, and, uh, um, and that's really where my research began. It began, you know, uh, looking at, uh, you know, the things that, uh, you know, the, the um, how these vets were coming back from World War One and uh, World War Two, and, and uh, you know, so when the clubs first started, they were just really a lot of war heroes. Why are you together. ending it? Why are you ending it now? Uh, I think for me, you know. Some of it is is the economics of of, uh, of the production model that after like seven seasons it, it starts to eat itself. But uh, um, I also feel like I've modeled the mythology in a way uh, that I knew I could 
tell seven seasons worth of story. And, uh, and I think we're getting to that place. And you sort of know when it's... You do. Yeah. You, ha you have to know. Uh, and, 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 and I love the fact that people hate that it's ending and the fans want more. I mean, you know, you, know, you always leave them wanting more, that's man. That's what Curtis said. <laughs> Don't do an hour show. Do 45 minutes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> you tweeted that you want Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad to appear this season. It's going to happen? Uh, you know, I... Uh, it, like like the fabulous world of Twitter is, I uh, was, I did I do these Q and A's on uh, on nights on Tuesday nights when the show would normally be airing if it were airing, and somebody asked me if, if there an actor I, I'd love to work with, and uh, and I said you know I love Aaron Paul, I think he's a great guy, and he is, and uh, um, uh, you know I, I like to work not with just talented people, but with people so who I know. So is it going to happen? I don't know. You know he 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 actually tweeted back at at, at one point saying that made a joke. Uh, saying that, uh, um, you know, uh, he's waiting for it to happen, and, uh, and you know, who knows? We'll see. Now, Charlie Hunnam, right, that's yeah. how we pronounce yeah. it, your lead actor, got the role of Christian Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey. Right, right. Stepped away from the part, mm -hmm. but did all the media attention. Did that, did that affect Sons of Anarchy? He's Charlie's, you know, I, I love Charlie. I think ultimately, and I don't, this is just speculation, because uh, Charlie's a really private guy, and, and I respect that, and... Uh, um, but, you know, I, I think that what happened is that the, the idea of that movie became bigger than the character and the work and everything else, and, and that's really not who Charlie is, and, and I think ultimately that's why he stepped away. Did you read that book? I did not read that Neither book. Neither did I. You know. Your beautiful wife, Katie Segal, yes, do, do, you, do you cast her deliberately? Did she have to try out? <laughs> I... Uh, uh, I actually, she actually, ins I will say, she actually inspired the role of Gemma. Not that she's as fierce as a, a mother as Gemma is, but <laughs> you know, I, I've always been impressed with Katie uh, as, as a mom. She's a, an amazing mother. How many kids you have? We, uh, I have two stepkids from her, a previous marriage of hers, and we have a seven-year-old together. Okay. Now, I'm told you get creative in using sexual terms and curse words. You, you sort of have invented curse words, right? <laughs> can you, can you? Kurt, give me some. Oh, man. Uh, I don't know if I've invented curse words. But essentially, I, I can't use... Uh, can I curse here? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't use the word uh, fuck on, on uh, basic cable. Uh, uh, so uh, it, Jesus Christ has sort of become my fuck. Um, but there was a... We, we had this whole season where we had um, um, uh, uh, porn. Uh, there was, they were in the porn industry, and, and I wanted to use terms like, you know, donkey punch and, and all this, you know, uh, and, and, and I kept getting shut down, so I had to make up my own terms. Give and they were, like. uh, what did we do? We did like anal rain dance, which just <laughs> sounds horrible. And I just, and then, you know, S&P was like, I don't know where that is. And, you know, so the ones I end up making up always sound worse than the ones that they won't let me I say. I know some Christians <laughs> who prefer <laughs> to Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know what? At, at a certain point, we were getting we were getting notes from above about you know you know can you cut down on 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 JC the, on JC yeah. and uh, you know I was like well if you give me something else I'll cut down on JC. What's next for Kurt Sutter when we get back? We're back with the enormously successful, deservedly so, Kurt Sutter. You're developing a prequel to the Sons of Anarchy. We'd like to, yeah. There's the been grandfather. We've been uh, <laughs> we've been significant. Uh, we've had significant discussions, and uh, um, that uh, you know the mythology is that the first nine were these first nine members, and uh, uh, we reference them in 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 uh, documents and and and, and story and. Uh, and I'd like to do an origin piece of uh, these guys coming together, so. Now, what is this coming next year on FX, and actually FX, where else? What's the bastard executioner? Uh, that's my, hopefully my next, uh, my next series there. We, Brian uh, Grazier working with you? Yeah, Brian, Good guy. A, a sweet guy. Not man. Ron Howard? Uh, not yet, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, Brian, uh, Brian and I got together really the same way uh, uh, myself and the Linsons did for this project, and. Uh, he was fascinated with the idea of a medieval executioner and uh, kind of gave me carte blanche to come up with the story in the world. And uh, so it is. It's about a, a story of, you know, medieval executioner and takes place in uh, 14th century uh, in, 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 uh, in the U.K. And uh, 
I'm actually heading over to London in a couple of weeks to start looking at some locations and stuff. So uh, you're gonna put Katie in that too? Uh, I, I probably will. I probably will. Yourself too? <laughs> at, not at this point, but you never know. What makes a good executive producer? Um, I think you ultimately have to balance the uh, uh, the creative input in terms of your vision. Uh, with uh, with a lot of people skills, um, and uh, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I, I think to really have a vision and to follow through, you can't lock yourself in the ivory tower and say, you know, somebody else do it. I think you just really have to learn. Hands on. Have to, yeah, you really have to be involved in, in all aspects. Southpaw going to be your first feature? Hopefully, yeah, yeah, it'll be, uh, I've written, uh, you know, I refer to my feature career as my virtual career because I, I write stuff and, and then I never know what happens. Has but, it been, uh, uh, this happened so many movies, has it been hanging around a while? Was Eminem supposed to? Yeah, yeah. I wrote it for Marshall and uh, and that didn't happen and uh, uh, I did a couple passes and uh, um, and uh, I think they're going to have somebody else do another pass because I, I, I don't have the time right now, but uh but you got Jake. Uh, we got Jake and, and Antoine Fuqua, who's a who's a dear friend and, and just a great uh, a great uh, director is, is Jake directing. Jake, a fighter in it. Yeah, he's training right now, and uh, and Jake, uh, uh, really great actor and really committed. And uh, what's harder to get off the ground, a film or a TV show? Uh, in my experience, features are much more difficult. It's just one of the hardest thing in the world is to get a movie made. Yeah, 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 and you see. Uh, and then, you know, the irony of, like, you just see so many bad movies out there. <laughs> you just go, that's the one they decided to make. You I'm know? told you wrote an article for Slate.com uh, about Google's stance on yeah. copyright laws. What, in essence, was that about? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, God, it's a whole other interview, but it's, um, you know, uh, there's just something going on right now with Google and, and uh, in terms of, um, really slowly trying to chip away at copyright laws that protect artists' content. Chip away how? Chip away in that they really, f under the guise of, of uh, hey, we all deserve a free internet, they are slowly um, spending millions and millions of dollars each year to undermine uh, uh, the copyright laws that protect artists and uh, it's sort of a little bit of a, a David and Goliath thing right now but it's it's we're trying to sort of wake up the creative community and you say you will prevail I don't know you know we're, we're slowly gaining some ground but uh, I'm just trying to uh, and 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 look the reality of it is I'll be okay but I look at my kids who you know want to be actors and, and writers and, and singers and songwriters and and, and and have desires to live off of their creative content and and I worry about them because you know if we continue this way um, they won't be protected and there won't be any kind of um, uh, you know uh, uh, economic um, model to protect them what's a day like for you now you got the, the executioner you got Southpaw, mm -hmm. uh, Sons of Anarchy, a prequel, The Shield's Gone. With the, <laughs> what, 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 uh, you bounce all these balls. You know, it's... Executive uh, producers do that, though. Yeah. They can I, handle many things. You, you, you sort of have to learn. I mean, I, I, I have a great and, and very talented staff. I mean, n not to sound, you know, overly self-deprecating, but I, I, you know, my... my my secret to my success is that I, I hire people who are a lot more talented than me, and uh, um, <laughs> you know. And That's I, what Ted Turner's philosophy was. I, I just, I just do, and and uh, I. Um, One has to ask, why all the tattoos? You know, I, they all have meaning and, and stuff, but uh, as I, as I said earlier, I, at, at the end of the day, it's all just a desperate cry for attention, really, Larry. Um, but uh, when did it start? At what age? Uh, I, I, I started late. I didn't get my first tattoo till I was almost 30. And uh, um, and then uh, uh, I just, you know, I love I love body art. Like the wife likes it. The wife likes it. I made the wife get a tattoo. And, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, not as many as those. No, not as many as those. And she's actually, you know, she's in the process of getting some more. And, uh, you know, but and my Unfortunately, the hard part is now I have an 18-year-old son who uh, wants luck. a tattoo, and, and what do you say? Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Kurt Sutter. I want to thank my guest, Kurt Sutter. Be sure to watch the final season of Sons of Anarchy on FX this September. And to hear Kurt's answers to your social media questions, check out our show blog, kingsthings.aura.tv. 
When we come back, we're joined by the man who brought you the huge successful series, Lost, Mr. Carlton Cuse. Welcome to Larry King Now, our special guest, Carlton Cuse, the Emmy, Golden Globe, and Peabody Award-winning writer and executive producer. He was named to Time Magazine's annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2010. Along with Damon Lindelof, he served as showrunner, executive producer, and head writer for all six seasons of the hit TV show Lost. Currently, he's the writer and exec producer of Bates Motel, airing on Mondays at 10 p.m. on A&E, and the upcoming The Strain, which will premiere on FX in July. You were pre-med, right? I was indeed. What changed you? What left you? The, what, the medicine, why did the world of medicine lose you? Well, I, I was, uh, first of all, I really didn't like uh, the pre-med classes that I was taking, and my mother saw that I was losing interest, so she had me scrub in for a surgery with my uncle, and uh, he was doing um, an intestinal bypass operation on a very obese person, and there was the smell of cauterized flesh, and he was pulling organs out of the incision, and I fainted. And that pretty much was the end of, <laughs> uh, end of medicine for what me. What took you to Hollywood? Uh, when I was in college, the filmmakers of a movie, Airplane, came, I went to Harvard, they came to Harvard to do a preview screening of the movie, and I met them, and I hadn't ever, you know, met anyone who worked on a movie before, and it just a light bulb went off in my head. I loved writing, and I, I basically thought, well, why not do this? Did you think of falling then into comedy? Airplane was one of the more hysterical movies ever uh, made. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of considered myself not that funny, so I, I thought drama writing was the better place to go. Actually, I started in, in the movie business and then worked my way into TV drama. I'm told. Now, you worked on Lethal Weapon, right? I helped develop Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, and Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. I, my, my former partner, uh, a guy named Jeffrey Bohm, was the uh, writer of record of those movies. What was your in entrance break? I basically got, I, I made a movie about, I, when I was in college, I rode crew, and I made a documentary about rowing, and I sort of took that as my calling card. I came to L.A., and I got the job as the assistant to head of one of the movie studios, uh, basically running errands for him, like getting organic dog food for his Japanese Akita, getting the windows tinted on his car, buying bagels at a certain place for him. It was glamorous. You, you co-showrunner on a lot of projects, right? How does a co-showrunner work? You know, television, the, what I love about television as an art form is that it's a really collaborative, and I think that the, the essence of what makes television successful is when you can put a really great collaborative team together, and I like that creative environment. So Who decides what? Like, you and, you and, and Damon, you co... Co-show ran Lost. Right. You know, it was really a situation where we had to come to an agreement, and that was, I think, one of the reasons Lost was so good. We, the bar for us was, is, some, is this idea good enough that both of us think it's cool? And if it wasn't, we would keep reworking and reworking until we both actually thought it was worthy. Tell me about the conception, how Lost came about. Lost came about, actually, before I was involved. There was an executive named Lloyd Braun at ABC who wanted to do sort of a scripted version of the show Survivor. And he took that idea, worked on it a little bit, got um, the director, J.J. Abrams, involved. And J.J. Um, in turn got Damon, my partner on the show, involved. They wrote a pilot, made the pilot. You weren't involved in the pilot. I was not involved in the pilot. And then J.J. left to go do Mission Impossible 3 with Tom Cruise. And um, I came in to run the show with Damon. Why did Lost work? I think Lost worked because it was different, because I think it broke a lot of the rules that people said you couldn't break in television. We right. had, like a huge and sprawling cast, people who had done really bad things, um, intentionally ambiguous storytelling, um, really complex mythologically based storytelling. All these things were things that, you know, there was really, I think, an attitude, particularly in 2004 when that show started in network television, that you had to kind of go for the lowest common denominator. And Lost didn't do that. Lost actually respected the intelligence of an audience. And I think that the audience in turn responded because the show, the show challenged them in ways that I think were interesting. Fans were very involved, right? Opinionated your fans. They contacted you. They were, they... Yeah, you know, I think what happened was there was this, this show that came, we made a show that, as I said, was a mystery and intentionally ambiguous. And so 
it raised a lot of questions. At the same time, social media came into existence. Just concurrently, yeah. there was the rise of social media. So there was this new mechanism by which people c could communicate. And then we had our show, which was very baffling and mysterious. And the two just kind of dovetailed. It wasn't anything that was predictable, but that's, I think, what contributed to the fan interaction level of the show that it had. You said you knew the layout of the show pretty much from the beginning. We Didn't knew. things evolve? Yes. You know, I think creativity doesn't come to you in sort of one fell swoop. You know, I think we had some of the basic ideas of the show in place, and but obviously over time you get more ideas and those ideas evolve. And you know, it's like a road trip. You know, you might know that you're going to end up in New York, but along the way you leave yourself room if you want to go to Wall Drug or take a rural back road or take the expressway this day. You know, we left ourselves all those kinds of latitude, and by the time we got to New York. We were enriched by the journey in ways that really informed the way the show ended. So Why did it go off? We, we ended it. We did something that was unprecedented at the time in network television history. In the third season of the show, we went to ABC and said, we want to end our show. Now, in television, you know, the way television works, you, it's like the Pony Express. You know, shows, you ride the show until it drops dead underneath you. <laughs> um, in our case, we, we had this mythology, and we didn't know if it had to last two seasons or nine seasons, and it was really hard to write the show. So we went to the network and said, look, we need to know how much longer we have to tell our story. And we agreed on three more seasons of the show, and that allowed us to sort of tell the story we wanted to from beginning to end. Did you ever regret it? No, not at all. What, do you think current shows like Resurrection, Revolution, Believe, following that trend of Lost, trying to mystify us? I think that um, I think that we opened the door for genre storytelling on the networks, which was something that was kind of dead. There was no science fiction. There was really heavily serialized storytelling. You know, wasn't really prevalent. I. So I think our show opened the door, but I also think that new technologies opened the door. The fact that people could DVR shows, that people could buy them on DVD, ultimately get them on, on iTunes. Demand. You know, you had this opportunity where people could catch up. You know, the, the networks were terrified that if you made a show um, and someone missed an episode, they would go away. But then all of a sudden, you had ways to actually watch the show other than just on the network. What makes a good showrunner? I think a good showrunner is someone who has sort of two sides to their brain. One side is you have to be very creative, on demand. You have to, this kind of massive, prodigious amount of creative material has to sort of flow from your head because you're making um, like 8, 10, or 22 little mini movies in a given year. But then you also have to manage this operation. You know, in the case of Lost, we had 425 people working for us. So there aren't that many people that kind of have both the right brain and left brain thing where you can sort of manage an enterprise that's spending millions and millions of dollars and also be very creative. You have to be a little nuts. You have to be a yeah. little nuts. Yeah. We'll talk about Bates Motel and the strain right after this. The idea of the writer's room is trying to apply the collective brain power of five writers to a problem as opposed to one writer. It's really the funnest part of making television. We have an all-female room except for Carlton's. He often feels like he's sitting in on the view. The writer's room kind of goes all day long. Carrie and I are in the writer's room a lot in the morning, and these guys will kind of carry on and work out problems. You're constantly throwing a ball, and someone else is catching it and throwing it to someone else. There is not a hierarchy. This is a round table. But where did the idea, why did you take a great movie, Psycho, wait all these years and come up with a Bates Motel? There was a, a sequel to Psycho, right? There were a couple of sequels Which to were Psycho. not very successful. Right. So why now Bates Motel? Well, I think basically the idea was, the, the idea that really intrigued me was Norma Bates was one of the most iconic characters in movie history, but we knew nothing about her. I mean, basically, in the movie Psycho, she is... We never met her. We never meet her. Well, we, we see her, she's dead and stuffed in, yeah. like, a chair, and she's a skeleton. So who was Norma Bates? And so the idea of sort of reinventing this mythology was, was very exciting. And what we did was basically decide was that, was that we decided we would do it as a contemporary prequel. So we kind of shed ourselves of the baggage of the movie by making the show set in the here and now. And we 
have Vera Farmiga, this amazing actress, playing Norma Bates, and she's actually kind of lovable, heartbreaking, charming, crazy, and we really realized that, you know, I think your expectation from the original Psycho movie is, is that Norma Bates was this evil shrew who berated her kid into becoming uh, yeah. a serial killer, but in fact, she loves her son to death, and he, you know, maybe it's in his DNA that he's going to become this guy, and she's desperately trying to keep him from becoming the guy that he's destined to be. Will it go on to eventually have him grow up? It will go on to eventually intersect with some version of that guy we saw in the movie. So it's a tragedy. And the thing is, if you went out, like, a lot of the best stories are tragedies. Shakespeare knew that. Um, yeah. Jim Cameron, you know, Titanic is a tragedy. Of course. But, but so, you know, I think that this is a, it's a great mother-son tragedy. You're also working on the, what I'm told is the highly anticipated series, The Strain, with Guillermo del Toro. Tell me about that. Guillermo del Toro and a guy named Chuck Hogan, who wrote the book that was the basis for the movie The Town, wrote this trilogy of books that, movie. That, that redefines the sort of vampire genre. This is not vampires like you've ever seen them, and that was why I wanted to do it. You know, we've seen the sparkly, romantic, brooding, lovelorn vampires. These are scary creatures that shoot six-foot stingers out of their mouths and suck you dry like a Capri Sun. And, uh, you know, it just, it's a completely different take on the vampire genre, but it's rooted in the actual old Roma, uh, Romanian mythology of vampirism. Coming when? It's coming um, this summer, in July most likely, from FX. Like other vampire shows, are you going to kill off different people every week? <laughs> uh, no. We'll kill vampires, for sure. Any scoop on the first season? Of uh, The Strain? <clears throat> um, the Strain is... It stars Corey Stoll, who you might have seen in House of Cards, who's a fantastic actor, and David Bradley, who was in all of the Harry Potter movies. And it is, as I said, it's sort of, it, it looks at this mosaic of New York City as this it's strain of vampirism. It's set in New York City, and this sort of strain of vampirism starts to overrun the city, and it basically completely topples the social order. And wow. uh, we have a character played by Kevin Durand, who's a rat catcher, who was kind of a low status at the beginning of this story, but very high status when, you know, his skill set is now highly, highly valued. It's all on the page, right? That's where good shows come from, what's written. I think good television shows, um, you know, I used to believe that it, was, that it was all the writing, and over time I really realized that it is the writing and, you know, I, I, I have to give even more credit to the actors than I used to give. I mean, I feel like if you have great actors delivering your stuff, it makes all the difference. I mean, I love the show True Detective that was just on, and it was great, but it was made really great because they had Woody Harrelson and Matthew McConaughey playing the leads. And I think you have to find that alchemy of a writer's room that can actually work together to produce really good scripts, and then you need really good actors to deliver your material. Are there specialty writers, writers who write good vampires, or is writing writing? No, there are definitely different types of writers who are good at anything else. It's a little bit like assembling a baseball team. You know, you, when you put a writer's room together, you are looking for a combination of talents. You might have someone who's a good, who's a, a good pitcher, but in, in, in television parlance, that's someone who's actually good at coming up with ideas in the room and throwing them out for the room to digest and turn into stories. You might have a good draft writer. You might have someone who's good at comedy. You might have someone who's good at dialogue. There's all sorts of different voices that come together to make a good TV show. Thanks, man. You're great. I want to thank great. my guest, Carlton Cuse. Be sure to catch Bates Motel on A&E Mondays at 10 p.m. and look for The Strain this July on FX. And check out Carlton's answers to our little game of If You Only Knew on our show blog, kingsthings.aura.tv. Remember, you can find me on Twitter at kingsthings. We'll see you next time.